Any questions? Thank you very much for listening. Oh, sorry, we got one. There's one here. Why don't you ask it? I just wanted to know the name of your book that you said. Oh, thank earlier. you. That's yeah. important. It's, uh, it's called Rebel Ideas. Thank you. Hi, uh, I've already asked it on Slido, but I'll ask it in person. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying, but what happens when your leadership team is lacking in diversity? Where, where do I find the, the, you know, the, the innovative ideas from? Where, where are you, uh, where, you're at university? Well, I'm actually a secondary school head. Secondary school. Well, um, the thing that leads people to push back on diversity and for the senior leadership teams not to think it matters is because they think it's a politically correct box ticking exercise that's going to have no, it's not going to help and it'll probably hinder. That's why diversity initiatives don't tend to work. Um, and by the way, diversity isn't that helpful in a very simple environment, right? You don't need it. So if you imagine, I remember going to an HR conference and a speaker was saying diversity, didn't, didn't define it, didn't analyze it, just said diversity will increase performance and it'll improve what you want to do. And a slightly awkward customer at the back said, imagine I had a four by 100 meter sprint relay team and I had the fastest runner in the world. Like, this is a big hypothetical. I had the technology to clone that runner. So I've now got four clones who are all very fast. Assuming they can pass the bat on, that's a quite a good team. If I diversified, you want me to hire slower runners. If I'm an Olympic coach, I don't want to do that. When people hear diversity, what they're often hearing is, oh, you want us to hire slower runners. That is true. That intuition, having written the book Rebel Ideas, I can't tell you how deep that intuition goes in HR departments and senior leadership teams. When you move from simple to complex, that flips. That's when diversity is your most important ingredient for success. And unless you make that conceptual breakthrough, I don't think you can get the senior leadership teams to care, except by going through the motions. Give them a copy of Rebel Ideas. But that, the, the purpose of the book, I mean, I hope that doesn't sound too self-serving. I might I'll only get a few sales. Um, uh, but, uh, it, uh, you know, we, we, we're working with a lot of great companies who have completely got the importance of this and are developing very powerful intuitions about how to pursue it well. Thank you. Hi, just uh, on the same sort of theme as my colleague there, just looking at if you're trying to, or have you seen good cases of where middle management have managed to transform and push upwards in their growth mindsets and their diversity thinking so that they're pushing upwards and saying, look, leadership above, and maybe not buying into it, how can they influence them, other than giving them a free copy yeah. to actually get that point? Have you seen any good examples of that that you could maybe well, share? Well, growth mindset, how to yeah. get them, yeah. So uh, pushing it up rather than it coming down. Yeah. Is there any way of getting that turned down? It's quite difficult to hear the question. Yeah, is that all right? Um, thank you, by the way. Appreciate it. Um, what, one thing I think is worth doing with growth mindset is getting to measure, get people to take the tool. Um, I've designed, you know, I feel like I'm selling stuff here, but I've designed one called Mindset Advantage, and we do it with our clients. You get a report and an opportunity for leaders or anyone else to just reflect, you know, wow, fix, I'm fixer. Maybe I have got stuck in an echo chamber. Maybe I do get defensive when people give me feedback or when a good idea emerges from another brain. Maybe I can collaborate more effectively. You know, maybe I need a different voice in this senior leadership team to challenge. Do you see what I mean? When you get a definitive report that shows some of the biases that you might not be aware of, it's a great way to be. That's what Nadella did at Microsoft with the senior leadership team. Got them to take it, got them on board, and then they began to drive it through a company of about 120,000 people worldwide.
Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. So, of course, diversity is really interesting when it comes to um, people of different ethnicities, different genders. But I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts more on class, how the clients that you've worked with have actually integrated different class backgrounds into the people in their sea level. I'd be really interested to hear how people have done that and your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, so it's yeah, a good question. So, social class is very, very important in lots of different contexts. It's not difficult to see why. If you imagine politics, any policy at a national level is going to impact people from lots of different social backgrounds. Therefore, if you have a cabinet who are from a particular social background, it is almost impossible for them to anticipate how that policy will impact people with very different kinds of lives. The poll tax is a very good example of this, which I go into in some detail in the book. The Tony Blair speech that I mentioned earlier gives you a good intuition. Companies that have looked closely at social class, I think poly uh, journalism needs to do it better. Um, PwC, which is a professional services company, have started increasing their intake from, pe from people who are from a poorer social background. The question is how to measure it. What, they, what they're doing is they're doing the measurement on postcode in which they lived at the age of about 11, and therefore some sense of... Uh, there's other criteria like free school meals, things of that kind. They're still hiring super talented people. You never compromise on talent, but they're getting much broader. Now, why would that matter in professional services? Well, I'm, you know, you can certainly imagine that a group of people who are from public Eton-type schools who then went to Oxbridge might not really understand how professionals might want to be paid. What do they want it weekly or monthly? What's the most convenient way to get it into their bank account? If you're in the consultancy division and you're advising on companies which have big retail footprints, you're going to want the people who are giving the advice to reflect the customer base that they're serving. Um, you probably would get a big effect on audit as well. Some of the downside risks of, you know, as I say, the, the more you spend time thinking about it, the more you begin to see that the most successful organizations are doing this, and that is their advantage. I mean, I can give you examples that give you a real mathematical sense of, I don't know if you've heard of the wisdom of the crowd effect with predictions. I mean, it is an absolutely staggering effect that most economists are unaware of. It's interesting. So, yeah, social class is a big deal. For most, almost all human-facing activities. Yeah, thank you. Um, this lady uh, on the, on, uh, just here, thank you. Hi, Matthew, thanks for your talk. Um, I wonder if you've got any comments or examples from a startup perspective. So I work for a startup, so there's a lot of actually learn it all mentality, but there's also the issue of kind of operationalizing that and organizing that. I'm just interested if you have any comments. Yeah, I mean, the, so I would say that for, I mean, it, it, startups, as you know, vary a lot. But broadly speaking, a startup commences with a fantastic idea. And when you analyze the great ideas of startups, they're often based on some kind of cognitive diversity. Somebody who got an idea from the, and like, oh wow, we can do this. It could have a single founder, but they've been in the right position within the flow of wider ideas. Same with great scientific innovators. At the scaling stage of the business, diversity is less important, right? Because you've got the idea, we now need to go and absolutely bang down doors and take it to market. Where it becomes very, very important is once scaling has taken place, and you're moving towards a listing. If in the private sector, then you need to start figuring out how the world is changing, how you need to adapt the product, how you need to start thinking differently about building new market shares in different parts. Do you see what I mean? So there are variants on that, of course. Sometimes startups do need diversity from the start. They need, because the, the, the process of scaling is more complex than just breaking down doors and selling, right? There might be some 
product improvements and, and so on. But, but uh, diversity for startups really comes into its own as, as scaling is, is, is moving towards its first peak. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, in, in my experience, I mean, as you say, diversity is really powerful. But if you get truly diverse groups of people, there's a real challenge of realizing the potential from them in the sense of valuing what other people are saying within that. And it takes some learning and training to understand just how to perhaps re realize that within that team. And I don't know whether you've got any comments on that. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And actually, I think this is something that is very misunderstood, if I may say so. A, gr a, growth, a growth mindset, diverse team. I used to be a table tennis player. You didn't expect that line, did you? Did you know, anyone know that? I was a British number one for 10 years. But imagine during my career, if I'd had a slightly defective forehand topspin technique. You know, it's a bit all over the place. And I get to the end of my career and my coach says to me, Matthew, your forehand topspin was, was really poor, technically, it was defective. But I never mentioned it to you because I was worried about hurting your feelings. How would I feel about that? I'd feel pretty disappointed, wouldn't I? In a growth mindset culture, it's not every idea is a good idea. If you think someone's idea is wrong, you have an absolute responsibility to criticize it respectfully. With different, you're right, managing that's a challenge. But when you, you should think of meetings as hypothesis testing. Somebody comes up with something, you challenge it, they challenge you, and that mutual critique and criticism takes you to where you want to go. If people aren't giving you that, it's a complete disaster. So you're absolutely right. That is what you get to with a growth mindset. In a fixed mindset culture, people are criticizing each other to put each other down and to look the smartest in the room. It's a zero-sum mindset of mutual recrimination and a lot of politics. Growth mindset culture, positive sum. Mutual criticism and disagreement, getting to the best idea overall. Um, making that really work, yeah, it takes a bit of time. But if, if, if you... But... Once you've got that culture, the meetings don't need to take that long. If it's a time-critical decision, you have the discussion, you take the decision, you're agile. The problem is if you don't have that discussion on a complex decision where no one has a monopoly of truth, you'll be quick but potentially wrong. This is what Elon Musk meant when he tweeted two or three weeks ago, it's no good digging fast if you're digging your own grave. In the tech space, you want to get both. You want to get the diversity, then you want to go out and execute fast. And I think, yeah, getting the culture right takes a bit of time, but it's well worth doing it and doing it well. Thank you. Hi, um, would you agree that the application of mental models would drive more diversity of thinking? Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, bro broadly speaking, that's really what it is. Um, when you say mental models, do you mean thinking styles or do you just mean heuristics? Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, what? Like, like first principles, second order thinking, um, yeah. um, inverse thinking as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But, but, but if you, diversity is bringing a richer array of information widely defined to problem solving, predicting, and innovating. One facet of that is different styles of thinking, analytic, vehilistic, causal, all of those can feed into that. It's very important for intelligence. GCHQ are very into neurodiversity because they want to search the fitness landscape in different ways in order to get to distinguish signal from noise. So it's quite, and uh, policing is, is, is thinking more about that too. So yeah, it's, it's part, of the, part of the overall thing. Couldn't agree more. Thank you.